Hello ladies and gents, I'm coming back at you with a uh, game analysis from the Superbet uh, Romanian uh, Super Grandmaster Tournament. This time around we are going to check out um, an awesome encounter between um, Levon Aronian and Alireza Firuja. The reason why I picked this game is because the end game that occurred in this game is hugely instructive irrespective of chess level there is a lot to take away from this game so i really hope that i manage i'm going to manage to break it down so that uh, we will all walk away with some uh, new learnings before i get into that please don't forget to like to sub and to comment below uh, some of you mentioned that the white background behind me is a little bit annoying and uh, i do not disagree with you uh, we are going to attend to that for the time being unfortunately this is going to remain white but in the future I'm hoping to change that to a different color. Um, in we go into the game. C4, C6 transitioning right away into a classical Slav defense. And in the Slav, we are aiming for a knight e5 variation. One of the most known main lines in the classical Slav. Knight d7, knight c4 and queen c7 is a very exciting way actually to treat this variation. Black is aiming to break e, uh, the center with e5 and to castle queenside. Amazingly, guys, this opening variation is actually about to become more than uh, just about 100 years old, at least on the very top level, because this variation was actually featured in the Alekhine Oeve or Aliehin Oeve World Championship match. So there you go, opening theory. Some of these lines are indeed very, very old. E5 takes, takes bishop f4. This was the big hype, by the way, in the uh, very early 2000s when Alexander Morozovic in particular brought this line back into fashion with the black pieces and uh, alongside him a fair few other top GMs um, picked it up. Uh, Mamed Yarov being one of them, who is also playing in this tournament. Knight d7, bishop g2, g5. This was, I believe, one of the new ideas um, around the turn of the century. Uh, the idea being, of course, that white cannot capture this because the knight is hanging. But knight e3 is a sneaky counter punch against the bishop on f5. And we end up in this very chaotic position, which again is still totally, totally book. Um, as a matter of fact, theory was followed all the way to here. And in fact, here we are following a game between Wang Hao and Hikaru from 2012, which was a draw. And I do think that Lev completely forgot theory because right here, right now, as I'm looking at the bottom right of my screen where I see the Grandmaster games, I still am looking at 15 games that followed exactly this path. Once again, Wang Hao Nakamura, Hare Krishna against Marcus Raga, uh, and so on. So this was known to theory, is known to theory. Um, Lev must have forgotten uh, what was going on here, knight c3 is the correct move when white is a pawn up but the black pieces in particular the knight duo with the queen they appear to be very very annoying uh, on the queen side and they do bring the heat queen e4 hitting b2 um, and yeah black is uh, definitely still in this game having said that Levon instead went with king e2 which I guess I can only guess was based on the assumption that a4 wasn't hanging, which is a correct assumption, by the way, because of takes, takes, and b3 is a fork. But somehow, uh, he must have overlooked queen a6. Which uh, was a real bummer for him, because now the discovered check is absolutely deadly. And uh, if I slide the king back to e1, now I can just take on a4, because after b3 comes bishop b4 check. And once again, the black pieces are flooding in via... Uh, the queen side uh, with a decisive effect and now my king will have to walk onto the dreaded diagonal and all kinds of knight discoveries will decide the game so that was the reason why um, yeah in this position we had these massive things and eventually Lev went uh, king f3 and that's when Ali Reza picked off the pawn. The big difference here that you need to understand is, is that now after take-take, there is no fork on the two knights because of the knight d2 check 
that picks off the B3 pawn. And essentially, now we are in a winning endgame scenario for black without too much of a doubt, to be fair. And that was actually the position where Levon spent an entire hour thinking what to do, which is quite ironic because he doesn't really have a move other than queen takes queen. So I dare say that part of that hour was spent on cursing himself for getting himself into this mess with uh, the king walk. So into the end game we go, which is where I really want to spend the lion's share of the time of this video. Rook A1, uh, Rook B1, excuse me. And even here, adding insult to injury, we can't even pick off C6 because Knight A4 is a threat with Knight C3 check. And so White does not have time uh, for free picking. We have to fix the fork. And there came Knight B6 blocking uh, the B file. Mind you, King C7 looks a heck of a better move to me. Uh, bringing the king closer to the center, allowing the pawns to move forward rather than going back and blocking our own pawn. I mean, I don't want to sound like I know my business better than Firuzia does, but um, definitely a lot better looking move to me, at least on a cursory glance. Anyway, so what's this? What's the story here? It's very important that when you land in an endgame, and actually I would like to swap the board around here, although that is going to mess with who is who on the layout. You need to have crystal clear plans. I spoke about the win condition as a concept in my previous video, and I really think that it has a great utility uh, in any endgame scenario, really, when you think about what do I need to do? Because a lot of lower rated players get lost in the, oh, there is that H2 pawn, I wish I could hunt it down. Like, that's not gonna get you closer to winning this game. The win condition here is to storm the pawns up on the queen side and promote ASAP, which is why by the way, I right away dislike this move because it goes against the win condition. King c7 followed by various pawn pushes, in particular a5, uh, which is supported by this bishop check, seems to be much more working towards the goal than knight b6 does. Anyway, bishop f3 was played, bishop c5 was played, it's fine, we need to develop knight h6, f6, very logical stuff, rook g1. Now, if I were black, I don't know how worried I would feel about the rook trade because it doesn't seem like our rook has a proper penetration point on the d file and the white rook certainly does have a very annoying g7 penetration, right? So if I were black, once again, on cursory glance, I would be like, okay, rook trade, fine, bring it. And I would be running right away now with the pawns just like he did. Check, check, take, all good, f5. A very important move to sneak in because now it takes a few more moves to conquer the pawn which is going to halt this pawn mass here king c2 a4 perfectly playing the win condition by the way knight h6 uh and by the way once again it's very important to here to go like do i go or do i defend the pawn and if you are going like oh i would like to defend this then you are definitely doing it wrong. And the reason why that's the case, because although it might look very scary to lose f5, because that allows white to have free passes, you can't prevent this from falling. Because even if you read out the knight to guard it, this bishop is going to attack it, and we can't defend it because we have opposite colored bishops. So definitely the best call is to go for broke, go for it. Because this pawn is already on the full rank. They don't even have a single passer here. So it's definitely the right call to make. Knight h6, knight c4. I really like it going forward, clearing the path for the pawns. Bishop e2, knight d6, temporarily guarding um, the uh, pawn. By the way, beautiful motif. I nearly forgot to mention this. Knight c4 was a really sneaky move because against knight f5, we have a3. And that's a really bitter reminder for white that although this is an end game where technique is super important, do you know what's more important? Tactics. That beats everything. Every time. And now after a3, it is time to put the pieces back in the box because a2, a1 is queen. And the only way to stop it is either king b1 or king b3. And whichever you pick, knight to check is going to hunt down the bishop. Tacticos. Every time, folks. Tactic, tactic, tactic. 
hence bishop e2 to cover that and bishop d3 to recover b5. Knight e4 was played. I don't know about this. I think b5 makes a lot of sense too. But I'm just going to let that slide because it makes sense to me. Now we can pick off f2 and e3 which would be huge. Because then whilst our pawns are not running we fully kill white's counterplay. So I'm all for that. But this time around of course the bishop was to take on e4. And after fe now unstoppably this guy is going to be hunted down. Again it's a good point to stop pause and reflect if you are in this game to think about what is going on and again the first thing you must notice that your win condition hasn't changed run like there was no tomorrow with your pass points alongside that you should note that you have got an optimal layout in terms of peace distribution because you have bishop versus knight and since we have got pawns on both sides of the field the bishop is going to be far superior to the knight. Picture a bishop on f8. That's going to hold this pawn forever. And at the same time, it supports the progression of the pawns on the queen side. Knights can't fulfill that duty. It's either going to be a defender or an attacker. It can't be both. Bishops, super easily. b5, outstanding. Knight f6. King c7, I'm fine with this. Knight takes h7, um, a practical choice because now there is a pawn that is further away from the main battleground and I do think that that's okay. Knight e4 would have been met with dimension bishop f8 when the far advanced pawn mass is definitely 100% going to guarantee victory for black. So knight h7 was played, b4 was played, knight g5 was played. Believe it or not, at this point, plus sorry minus nine that's the engine's evaluation so if you feel bad about your end games and your end game technique here we go 2800 fails to convert minus nine now that sounds really um patronizing and uh you know like not the right call to make from this chair and it certainly isn't but i wanted to inform you that that's what's been happening obviously this is still not easy to win but neither is it really that hard let's see B3 check, not really the optimal move, but I still don't think that there is anything wrong with it. And by the way, the engine agrees that this is no biggie. B3 is fine. The engine's favorite is King B6 and bring the boss up, which is inevitably going to have to happen. King B2, Bishop B4. Now, when I looked at the game first, I really disliked this move because I just wanted to run my king in. So my winning plan here for black was king b6, knight e4, drop the bishop back, walk the king all the way to b4, and then a3 check and we win. Yeah, the reason why we need the king on b4, because otherwise when I play a3, b3 hangs. And note that this is, by the way, um, the, play, the most direct way to play to my win condition. So I said, I am going to win by pushing my queenside pawns up. And that's what I'm trying to do. I go here, you do blah, I go up, you do blah, I go up, and you're out. You're done. It's that simple. Except, and again, here is where tactics and strategy overlap in that mysterious Venn diagram where there is that little overlap there. It is a terrible mistake to drop back here because now knight d2, knight takes b3 makes the position very problematic. I'm not saying that it's not winning for black. In fact, I reckon it is. But boy, you don't want to do that if you can help it. And this is why Firuja chose to play uh, in this position correctly, by the way, bishop b4. Because now after knight e4, the knight has got no access to the squares from where it could sacrifice itself. And now comes uh, the real deal. And that is that, remember how I told you I wanted to get my king up here to play a3? Well, that's not doable now, right? But that doesn't mean that you give up on the plan. That means that you, if it doesn't really work, you try to alter it. What was the condition again? Push the pawns up. What does that exactly mean in terms of what to do? What it means is you want to go a3. Why can't we do that? Because the pawn on b3 is not guarded. King b4 was the plan to guard it. Well, we can't do that. Can I do it in a different way? Yeah. 
put the king on c4. And that's it. This is how simply this endgame could have, should have been won by black. All I, he needed to do was king here, whatever, king here, whatever, king here, and on your bike. In fact, the most beautiful variation here is really instructive. Check, king back, king d3, and for argument's sake, I played here f3. And here comes the real beaut. a2 check, king b2, check, takes, king c2, and it's gonna be mate in two, actually, uh, according to the engine. So I will go with that. If the knight moves, it's mate here. If the knight doesn't move, it's check, checkmate. And that, by the way, is an absolutely perfect textbook way to model my concept about win condition. Because what do we need to do up? Which was part of the win condition, which was push your pawns up like there was no tomorrow, because that's what connected passes should do. Now we can't do that because b3 needs guiding. Da, 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 and you just go. And look how beautifully the bishop operates uh, as an attacker as well as a defender. This line is an epitome, a an absolute, like a statue for what it means to have knight versus bishop in scenarios where there are pawns on both sides. But it's also a very good example for having a clear plan and following it through consistently. Now, I don't know what Firuzia miscalculated because the, the way he played it looked very promising too. But this somehow just appears to be a little too slow or rather c4 and then an a3. And here there is an extra problem that you have to calculate knight c3. And this pawn ending is an absolute nightmare. And I'm going to turn the board back now to White's point of view. It's an absolute nightmare to calculate and the slightest mistake in your calculation is gonna change the evaluation drastically from win to draw or from draw to loss. Which certainly isn't the case as long as bishop knight's on the board. You can make inaccuracies, you can make a mistake and still retain a completely winning position. But once these guys are off, if you just make one step wrong, you are out. And it turns out that allowing it was the one step wrong. Because knight c3 now hits a4, so this is forced. And now there is an absolutely divine method to hold the draw here for um, white. That is to come back to b2. That's absolutely vital because if you push the pawn, pawn in, pawn in. So I will show you this. And then c3 check and black promotes to pawn. So first he plays king b2. And now you really need to nail it. And white just hangs in there by the skin of his teeth. So now black is threatening to win by king here, king here. Letting these guys run but having a faster queen here. I will show you what it looks like. Here, 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 here. Up, check, up, uh, sorry, king here, um, check here, and uh, either or wins. Uh, it could be a3 or king a3, it doesn't, uh, yeah, it does matter actually, because one of them is a force mate. a3, up, up, and um, although white promoted first, but there is no medal given out for that achievement. The medal is given for checkmate. And even if it weren't a mate, new queen, definite win. So uh, there is that there, and for that reason, after king b2, king d6, white had to go f5 to take the sting out of this plan, because then this pawn is too fast. Having said that, that means that this pawn has been given up, because after king e5, we can't guard it. Because if we do guard it with e4, in comes the king again, and then this check will again decide the game to uh, black's favor. So what we needed to do here is to play pretty much anything that this allows the king to penetrate. And so we just arrived on time to f3 when neither of the king penetrations are allowed. And after king takes f5, we had h4. Super important, by the way, to have that because otherwise white would end up in a zugzwang. So if you picture this endgame without the pawn on h2, then if I push either pawns, that will allow the black king to come in, either here or if I play f4, then here. And the white king is out of moves, because if I go here, it comes down here. If I go here, it comes down there. But because of the h-pawn is on the board, now the three pawns just balance each other out. It's by no default that it's a draw, because the black pawns are far, far further advanced than the white uh, 
white pawn, sorry, the white pawns, and therefore um, it's a major, major struggle to hold the draw. And the only reason why we can is because this king is far enough from b4, and also because we managed to cancel out all the penetration points. King e5, h5, king back, and f4, and again, just on point. Like, all the way, white is just walking that extremely fine line that now king e4, h6, king d3, h7, c3, check, still doesn't quite win because after king a3, he queen, and queen here, now we can just take, and apparently that queen ending is not winnable by engine's measure. I would have tried it, by the way, with black. I think this is a very playable story. Well, obviously, white will have to find a fair few accurate checks to navigate the position. But um, yeah, it's still a draw. Firuji opted for king e4. Oh, actually, he didn't. Wait, that's exactly what happened. I'm being a doofy. Never mind. Uh, and then uh, the accurate checks did come. Note, by the way, that the white pawns actually often help black because they provide shelter from checks coming from the side. So eliminating those pawns obviously um, had a double effect. And now the checks keep on raining down. And uh, here comes the big finale. Queen takes b2. Boy, what a way to finish this game. Um, I wanted to put an adjective there about what game it was, but I just didn't know what to say. I wanted to call it great, but if you consider quality, if you consider missed opportunities, you can't call it great. If you consider entertainment, certainly. Um, and if you consider learning opportunities, which is what I think I really like to display on my channel, then boy, this was amazing. That was just an awesome opportunity to, to explore how this endgame um, layout or structure and the piece distribution, knight versus bishop, uh, could work um, in a scenario where there are pawns on both wings. I found it hugely hugely instructive i hope you did too please uh once again don't forget to to comment to like to sub um and i'm going to be back with a new video soon thanks for watching